Good morning and welcome everyone to today's session. We are delighted to welcome Andy Sprayson from Auto Spray Systems, and he is going to be talking today about unmanned aircraft uses in agriculture, including spraying and spreading. It's, we'll explore how drones can work within the agricultural sector. And obviously this is a within the UK, still a very new area that uh, drones have been uh, able to, to work in. Auto Spray Solutions uh, currently is under test, undertaking testing and seeding spraying within traditional agricultural settings. They have an operational authorization, an OA, from the UK CAA to use uh, drones for this use case. And their staff also are a UK CAA approved recognized as assessment entity with over five years experience and write the safety case for the CAA, which they accepted and ultimately approved their OA based on this documentation. And this is the first authorization of its kind in the UK. They have a proven track record of developing a product and developing new marketplaces for these products. Andy himself is a, has a professional background in the emergency services involving critical incident planning, search and rescue operations and resource management. Andy's been an unmanned aircraft pilot <laughs> For over seven years and his company has been a CAA approved recognized assessment entity since 2018. He's also a qualified counter drone operative and deployed this technology in the field. Uh, he has created uh, unmanned aircraft departments in over 300 organizations and is still a very high standard of safety. In 2020, Andrew co-founded Auto Spray Systems and developed the methodologies and risk assessments associated with obtaining an authorization to spray chemicals with a drone that's over 25 kilos and for agricultural slash horticultural and forestry uses. Andrew has further developed a bespoke training package for remote pilots to adopt these skills and utilize the technology in farming. And Andrew also co-wrote the Lantra approved chemical drone spraying qualification. You may have to explain what Lantra stands for, Andrew, in a moment. Okay. But uh, thank you very much. As you can see, uh, Andy is, is highly qualified within this area, and we are delighted that he is able to come here today to share his knowledge with us. Um, Andy, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm going to mute myself and turn my own camera off and over to you. Well, I'll wait until you, I know your, your uh, presentation is, is being shared okay first. Okay, cheers. Um... I'm sort of ready now if you are. Um, yes. Share. Let me get this going. So, hi everyone. Thanks for uh, coming on to this RPAS hosted sort of CPD session about aerial, sort of unmanned aerial drone spraying and seeding. Um, thanks for the intro as well. Um, I was going to sort of cover a lot of that just now, but um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so the topics that we're going to cover today is a bit of a self-introduction um, about me and who I am. Um, so sort of why now and what the current regulator approach is, what the regulatory requirements are in order to sort of operate an unmanned drone and spray and spread for agricultural, forestry or horticultural uses. And then I'm just going to take you through a couple of case studies of some of the work that we've done, greenhouse shading, fertilizer, nitrogen, sort of granular application, golf course seeding, forestry seeding, um, spraying Jersey wild potatoes over in Jersey. Um, another look at sort of different type of biologics that you can spray and spread. Quick look at control substances, so to be honest with you, we'd need a couple of days to sort of cover that minefield and there's a lot to cover. So I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview so you can start to look into that sort of yourself. Um, quick look at the pesticide sort of regulatory requirements, training options out there. And then we've got kept a fair chunk of time for sort of questions and answers at the end of the uh, sort of presentation. Um, so. So basically, why now and what's changed um, 
In July 2021, we obtained an authorization uh, to operate drones between 25 and 150 kilograms, which was commonly referred to as the PDRA2. I think we were one of one of a handful of companies who obtained that. Um, nothing special about us. It was just the fact that we made the application. Um, I think it was two or three of us. It also allowed us to sort of, uh, sort of drop and spread articles as well. Um, so we used this to operate one of the older drones we have, which is an XP2020. It weighed around 40 kilograms, uh, fully loaded. Um, we've made the most of this permission and we used it to get a lot of flying experience and test several use cases, which I'll run through with you shortly. Um, the, whole day, the whole point behind the PDR-82 was to allow operators to practice and do the very thing that we've outlined um, in our current sort of operational safety case. And the whole idea was for, for you to allow you to sort of conduct experiments and it wasn't really for commercial uses. Um, some of the work we did caught the attention of the PW of PricewaterhouseCoopers who approached us to provide comment and some imagery on what we have been doing. Um, so who, who am I basically? My, I'm Andy Sprouse and I co-founded Pigs Can Fly and Auto Spray Systems. Um, as mentioned previously, my background is mainly emergency services. I came across drones when I was dealing with an emergency incident in, back in 2016. Um, I had no prior experience of drones and this particular operator was making quite a lot of money with a Phantom 3. Obviously, I wanted to part of that and began a drone journey with a Phantom 4 and formed Pigs Can Fly. Um, we got an OA back in 2017 or a permission for commercial operations. And we've got like a nice old authorization number these days. Um, a year into that, we decided we wanted to become an NQE and we got that authorization back in 2018. Um, I was wanted to reiterate the fact that I had no prior experience of not pilot, not a farmer. Um, I wanted to make this point pretty clear that it's you are able to do this as well. Um, I'm going to try and keep this as unbiased as possible as I possibly can because this is an half past CPD session, but all my videos are branded auto spray systems. I'm going to talk about what, what we've been doing. So please um, I apologize for that. Um, so one of the questions is what brought us to look at spraying? Um, and to be honest, I don't really know. I can't really answer you, you properly. Um, we began to look at it back in 2019. Um, we had early talks with XAG about importing some drones. Um, however, as, as we all know, COVID came in and just put a sudden halt to everything. Um, we had established this relationship with XAG and we were privy to some of the work they were doing in China to fight COVID. And they were undertaking large scale drone spraying sort of operations of public spaces. Um, and I mean, large scale swarms over cities, over parks, um, quarantine zones, anything you can think of they were doing. And we thought that'd be a good idea um, to maybe try and do in the UK. So, we suggested the idea to our pass. They acted really quickly. We established a working group and a proposal that we submitted to the UK government. We already plans to train hundreds of pilots at Harper Adams University. Um, the army was sort of, you know, we were talking to the army to deal with like logistics. Um, however, you know, lockdown came in and basically it worked. Um, virus was you know killed by us simply staying away uv light sunlight the likes of that um, made public areas safe to return to and our use case was no longer valid really so then we refocused our uh, research and our time back into the agricultural use case um as i mentioned before um, we were doing all this work under the PDRA2, and that caught the attention of PwC, who asked us to provide like comment, and they did, they did like a short story in their Skies Without Limits um, document, which I'm sure some of you have read. Um, 
They highlighted that drones will contribute around £45 billion to the UK economy by 2030. Um, they reckon another 900,000 drones are going to be operating in the skies, 650,000 jobs, a saving of 2.4 million tonnes of carbon. Um, you know, so they're quoting quite big numbers there. And if you look at the, the graph on the right there, um, number one is public and defence, health and education, but number two is agriculture, mining, water, gas and electricity. Um, so they've clearly identified that drone spraying is one of the, the big sort of growth sectors um, to come from manned aircraft. And um, there was a severe sort of lack of it in, in Europe, let alone the UK. Um, this then led us to sort of also be mentioned and highlighted in the UK government drone ambition statement. Um, unfortunately, you know, it was written by the chancellor who you know, didn't really last that long. But nevertheless, this sort of helped us sort of with the helped us have a voice and explain and show and showcase that you know we are pushing the boundaries and we want to sort of bring unmanned aircraft sort of drone spraying agricultural uses um, into the UK. So Around January 2022, the CAA undertook a review of the PDRA-based authorisation that we had, um, the PDRA-2, and they agreed to honour the current 12-month permission we had, but they were to halt any further applications or renewals. Um, this fast-forwarded our work, really, and we then started working hard to develop our safe working practices to support an operational safety case applications to the CAA. Um, one of the issues we did face was who and what comes first. Um, the Aviation Authority wanted us to, you know, to, they wanted a permission from the Health and Safety Executive to spray for agricultural uses. However, the Health and Safety Executive wanted to see a permission to fly first. Um, we did ask our past to assist with us and bring these departments together to help figure out what comes first. Um, the, the drone ambition statement and the PWC document was a big help in um, changing and influencing sort of minds and policies within different departments of the regulators and um, in the UK. Um, and we, we basically came to an agreement that these departments would mandate their own remit. So an aviation authority would mandate obviously unmanned aircraft and the health and safety executive would mandate um, any sort of spraying of, of controlled chemicals and things like that. So we then focused on getting submitting the operational safety case, and then we would then use that and then work with the health and safety executive or the chemical regulations division to um, develop any sort of missions and things that we might need to spray controlled substances. Again, I'll, I'll cover that in a bit more detail later. Um, so moving on to sort of what's required for you to essentially um, spray or drop articles from a drone. Um, our author uh, operational authorization allows us to operate up to about 93 kilograms. Um, it allows us to drop articles for agricultural, horticultural and forestry uses. We have an exemption from something called Article 91 of the Air Navigation Order 2016. Um, I would urge you to go and take a look that's essentially a piece of legislation that prevents anyone operating an aircraft for agricultural, horticultural and forestry uses without something called an aerial permit. Um, there is CAP 414, which offers guidance surrounding an aerial permit um, <clears throat> for aircraft. It was written many years ago. It's developed specifically for manned aviation, but well, there is a lot of information in there that helps us um, to develop our operating practices and, and safe working practices for unmanned aircraft. So I'd urge you to take a look at that. Um, however, we're exempt from the requirements within CAP 414 and Article 91. Um, so we developed a, an OSC, which I've mentioned quite frequently. I've just sort of presumed that a lot of you might know what that is. But an operational safety case is a third party risk assessment. Um, and you are sort of, 
you know, you, you are highlighting and identifying the risks and how to mitigate them. Um, what do you think is safe and, and not safe? What are the risks from dropping anything from a drone? You know, what are the risks from flying a heavy drone? Um, I, I can't really answer them for you. We've answered them and, and we've satisfied the regulator in, in our ability to operate safely. But what I think is safe, might, you might think it isn't safe. Um, it's a bit of a kind of, kind of worms, to be honest with you. The only thing I would say is don't forget that we're flying really, really low. Um, we generally operate two, three meters above the application area. So say two meters above uh, crop or wherever we're spraying you know and that's obviously very very low traditionally we're used to flying quite high aren't we or high in relation to that anyway um within our operate authorized operation uh sorry within our oa um, we are able to spray and drop and spread uncontrolled substances um we can do that right now, and we've been doing that uh, for several months, which um, I'll show you some videos on that shortly. Um, I'd like to add that it's a very, very important point, and I'll hammer that home throughout the presentation. Uh, controlled substances, or commonly referred to as pesticides, are subjected to additional permits by the HSE. Um, again, I'll go into that in a little more detail later. So this is just a short sort of overview of our fleet and some of the, the drones and sort of devices we're operating. Um, the smallest one is our bicopter, it's the V40. It's maximum takeoff weight, it's about 45, 46 kilo. Um, it's got a good droplet micron range, um, 10 liters per minute flow rate. We can put, we can use it a granular tank and um, that goes up to 25 liters um, it's IP67 rated um, the batteries charge in about 15 minutes and then our sort of main sort of workhorse at the moment is our P40 drone it's slightly bigger 49 kilos that can carry 20 liter um, sort of spray tank 25 liter granular tank again they're all IP67 rated so you can wash down safely batteries recharge off-site, we've got a little generator, we can do that in 15 minutes. And then the largest drone that we've got is, um, that we've just recently got authorization to fly just last week. Um, again, we're back to a quad, max takeoff weight is really heavy, about 93 kilo, 40 litre tank, 60 litre granular tank, um, IX7 rated. Um, again, it's all the same battery, it's all the same ecosystem, it's just slightly bigger. So all the batteries that we use in the V40, we can use in the P40, we can use in the P100. Um, same generator, same charging system, um, same sort of ecosystem, which is really good. Um, the battery charging is amazing. When we're doing a, a flight, you know, we might be changing batteries every 10 minutes, changing tanks every 10 minutes as well. Um, if we deploy the drone and we've done a 10-minute flight and the tank is empty, the battery may have 75, 80% left. And just through good practice, we generally swap the batteries out too. Always keep them topped up and um, charging. And we can shorten that 15 minute recharge to about five minutes. So we've got enough batteries to continuously run and we just sort of stack up the tanks ready to go. Um, it's a bit like an half one pit stop change. Um, one of the other drones we've got is something called it's a, it's a VTOL drone, it's a fixed wing sort of VTOL where we can uh, obtain sort of RGB data, multispectral data. Um, what we're trying to do there is move towards intelligence lab sort of farming and applications. Um, for example, if we could scan a field and find a nitrogen deficiency in the northeast corner, we can simply go and spray that area as opposed to a traditional method of self-propelled sort of sprayer or spreader spray in the whole field because it's such a big piece of machinery it uh you know if you're going to take it up there you may as well spray everything and you know the cost of fertilizer has gone up over 800 percent so there's lots of cost savings to be had um everything's controlled with an app we've got um this nice little sort of tablet it's got a picture there to show you it's you know 
submersed in water, interchangeable batteries, um, it's, it's, it's rugged. Um, the software is built in to allow us to fly up to five drones at any one time. Again, we don't have permission to do that, and we've not done that. That's something we're going to explore doing um, over in Jersey. Um, so moving on to our first case study, this is greenhouse shading. Um, this takes place every year by the majority, if not all, large scale, large scale indoor greenhouse nurseries up and down the UK. Chalk based paint is applied to the exterior of the roofing. This creates a white coating which reflects the heat of the sun and therefore protecting some of the most sensitive species becoming too hot and damaged. Um, shading greenhouses used to be quite dangerous. It's, uh, it's a slow business that involves brave people balancing on, on as you can see on the video there on the gutters, um, dragging a real heavy sort of 100, 100 meter hose across the glass roofs. Um, now we've used the same shading agent, agent and we've put it into the drone. Um, this video shows us using a single, uh, this is the old XP2020 drone, 20 litre tank spraying a 3,000 square metre greenhouse in less than an hour. Um, we really, you know, the spray operators are happy because they've not been bouncing on the glass roof. The health and safety manager is happy because they don't need to justify dangerous activity. Um, the owner is really happy because he's cut his application time in half and greatly reduced his uh, use of, of, of shading. Um, so, for example, on, on that site alone, we saved over £7,000 in paint. Perform the task in a day when it usually takes five plus, and we um, didn't require to apply the removal agent, which is usually required in autumn, um, because we had a, a gradual application, almost like you know, slow, you know, multiple sort of coats of paints, as opposed to um, a person doing it on their own without any sort of um, way to measure how much paint they were using. Um, they, the, the shading agent weathered off. Over, over the summer, and um, we saved another £7,000 in removal costs. Again, this is an uncontrolled substance. It's something we can apply um, today, tomorrow, every day. Um, it's not a controlled substance. Um, the next sort of case study we want to sort of throw over is um, the spreading of fertilizer and a nitrogen application. Um, this is only a very short video. I just wanted to give you an idea of um, sort of some of the possibilities. Um, you know, here, here, we, here we are, we, you know, we're spreading fertilizer, nitrum. Um, it's an uncontrolled substance. It's a granular fertilizer. And what's happening here is the, uh, the team at this farm, they sprayed pesticides using traditional methods, hand, handheld knapsack sprayers. And they were spraying something called Thistlex to stop rolling thistle um, on the grazing pastures. And after they'd made that application, we came in with the drone and fertilized the whole area. With the idea being that well fertilized and fed sort of fast growing grasses would outperform sort of weeds in the future. Um, so we're seeing gains there. We were able to do that in about 15 minutes, um, which would have taken them um, a lot longer using traditional methods and you know, we're increasing productivity, we're saving the amount of chemicals and chemistry that needs to be put down that band because the grass is then outcompeting the weeds. Another case study that we recently performed was um, golf course seeding. Um, this was a, an England sort of golf championship venue with a sort of high standards sort of uh, groundsmanship in the UK. They have a series of environmentally sensitive, sensitive sand dunes that needed to be reseeded. Um, they looked at us and um, for a method that could minimize the impact on the course and the players and the dunes themselves. Um, with a, within a couple of hours, we put down 80 kilos of dune specific grass and appropriate fertilizer um, had been applied and play was able, you know, was to be able to resume much earlier. Um, 
we did an inspection of the treated area and we were, you know, the, the client was extremely sort of impressed with the speed and simplicity of the whole process, not to mention the sort of the coverage. Um, we were able to do that by 10 a.m. Normally that would take a couple of people, a few hours to do. Um, so you know, we're reducing the impact on the, the business as a, as a golf course. We've come in and done it before the golf course was open. We've made savings on um, the amount of seed being used. We're able to calculate and you know uh, give them a, a, a definitive figure of how much seed have been used to enable sort of calculated sort of figures and costings. Um, yeah, all done in the morning. Uh, pretty simple stuff. It was a really easy one. It was a nice one. Um, I just wanted to show you one of the other sort of potential use cases out there that are already sort of now. It's an uncontrolled substance. Um, yeah, really good job. Oops. So I've spun my uh, mouse wheel there. Another big job that we had recently um, is forestry sort of reseeding up in the highlands in Scotland. Uh, it was one of the hardest ones we've ever done. Um, we were asked by Forest Research um, to take up the P40 and assist with some reseeding. Um, so the target was the steep mountain slopes that surrounded the rest of the Thankful Road just north of Glasgow on the 83. This is one of the main arterial road links uh, between Glasgow and the west coast of Scotland. It has a constant flow of traffic, especially during um, the, you know, the nicer weather sort of months. Um, it's, the area is plagued by landslides that regularly close the road and um, the detour adds hours to the driver's journey, which is an impact on local businesses. The goal was to replant the main slip sites with varieties of native birch seeds in attempts to stabilize the slopes. Uh, working in conjunction with Forestland Scotland, we assembled a crack team um, to do this. We needed people who knew the landscape like the back of their hand and the type of resilience that can, you'll get from working up on the mountains for a living. This is where the lads from uh, Forestland Scotland came in. Um, there was a lot of planning involved in this. Um, you know, we had to, we had to make a, a temporary takeoff and landing zone due to the terrain. We loaded the drone with the 25 sort of litre sort of hopper with fine birch seed, checked the system out, um, all, everything was worked fine. We had to position the RTK above us so we could maintain constant visual line of sight. Um, that's why we carried the drone up and, were, and, and done it sort of like the hard way as it were. Um, so our, our sort of total distance from the takeoff point to the slip site was about 380 metres, but because of we positioned ourselves appropriately, we reduced that to around 200 meters. Um, it was never more than 200 meters from us, and we really just wanted to make sure we could keep that um, insight at obviously at all times. Um, due to the difficult terrain, the, the drone is has built in sort of lidar terrain follow and um, obstacle avoidance, and you know. Might be a surprise to you, but we turned off obstacle avoidance to, con to, to conduct this mission. Um, when we're going up a steep slope, the terrain follow works perfectly. It's got like a one millisecond response time. But to the obstacle avoidance sort of also kicks in as well and it sort of prevents the fly happening. So we have to turn off turn off the obstacle avoidance and just you know rely on the obstacle on the terrain follow to maintain our sort of well five meters sort of. Um, application distance that we used um, on this job. Um, yeah, it was a oops. It was a great success. We put down something like twenty million seeds, so we hope we we'll get around two hundred thousand new birch trees coming through. It's quite a high sort of attrition rate. Um, that's um, it was a lot faster than sort of hand planting sort of saplings. Um, another case study I wanted to show you was it's a similar sort of steep sort of um, hillside one. It was when we went, we were invited over by Jersey World Potatoes to perform some um, trials. Um, so we took the, the P40 and the, and the, uh, the P100. Their aviation authority gave us uh, 
and operational authorization to operate there. So we've got permission to, to continue and go back and uh, keep doing the work there. Um, the steep sort of little fields that they have, they're all about like something like 0.5 hectares, some, sometimes one hectare. They've got something like 1,200 fields or coaties as they call them there. And these are all scattered all over the island. What they do there is the, the, at the top of the hill that you can see now, the tractor comes up with a big sort of, you know, thousand litre tank. Three men carry a horizontal boom sprayer down the steep hill, pull it back up, fall in the spray, and they get covered in all the chemicals that they're using. And because they're so exhausted after going up and down that steep hill, carrying a big, heavy horizontal boom sprayer, you have a second team to take over to do the second, second application. Um, we basically sprayed that in about 15 minutes um, from the comfort of the, the top of the hill. Um, we're able to accurately calculate what we'd put and where. Um, again, using data, multispectral data before and after the flight. Um, it's far more sort of data-driven application now. And we're working on developing some more use cases and methods with Jersey Wild Potatoes. Um, but yeah, it was a great job, worked brilliantly. Again, obstacle avoidance off, um, but LIDAR train follow on. Give you an idea of how steep it is. You see Rob there struggling to get up. So I just wanted to sort of have a quick look at um, some of the other things that you, you, you can sort of spray and spread, and some of the biologics that we're sort of working with. Um, at the moment. So one of the things is called a nematode. They are basically very sort of microscopic sort of roundworm and we're using them to basically kill sort of caterpillars and oak procession moth. Um, we spray, you know, you mix them with water and you could spray millions onto a single tree. And again, attrition rate is really high. UV light kills them. The sprain discs kill them. Um, but all we need is a few to sort of remain on there and, and we'll start to get to work. Um, if you don't know what a nematode is, I encourage you to sort of have a, have a look on Google. But if you were to sort of lose focus on something or purposefully focus off your screen now, and you see something move across your eye or something looks a bit blurry, um, that's a nematode. And they live in your eyes and they sort of eat sort of like pests and disease and dirt and things like that. So I like that. Um, another one is like mites. Um, we're able to sort of spread mites. Um, they sort of target, they're like called a predatory mite. Um, they target sort of locusts, for example, or different types of small sort of animals. Um, this was a use case that was done um, in Africa. And there was an application on to you know farmers having trouble with locusts, they spread predatory mites. Um, and the farmer to begin with at, to, at the beginning was quite sort of unhappy, really. He was like, Well, I wanted like an instant reaction or like the locusts to sort of die straight away. And this application took four days, but what we found was the sort of the kill rate was hundred percent all the locusts, all the larva um, were had, had died and save the crop, whereas with a pesticide application, you need to get the pesticide onto the locusts themselves, whereas these mites they spread all over each other in the colony, and it's a really sort of interesting sort of application. What I'm trying to get at is, yes, spraying pesticides with the drone in the UK is a no-go at the moment, but there are lots of things that we're currently doing and can do, and we're still developing. It sort of brings us on to control substances and pesticides. So control, you know, a pesticide is a control substance. Um, we've got an agreement that would sort of stick to on-label applications. Um, I'm just going to quickly cover sort of what drift data is, application plans that the HSE, CRD will require, and an aerial permit. Um, so you need to, if you were to spray a, chem, a, a pesticide in the UK, one of the things you're going to have to sort of create is an application plan. An application plan is you telling them where and what you're spraying and how, and you know how you're going to file reports to them. Um, 
There is a sort of UK drone spraying stakeholder group that we're a member of. Um, it's pretty much open invite. I'm sure you, if you wanted to get in touch, I'll be able to sort of help you sort of uh, get an invitation to the group. Um, more minds, more voices, more than welcome on this sort of subject. Um, you'll learn a lot. Um, and we've sort of got an agreement in place to do something that we call spray on label. And here's an application of the product label for Bracken. So when we say we spray on label, is we, we're not changing anything that the label states. If the label states that we've got to spread, uh, we've got to stick to an application rate of 55 litres a hectare. If you look on the, on the left side of column, it says helicopter aerial application. Apply Azulox with 11 litres per hectare um, with a spray volume, including water of 44 litres a hectare. So we're spraying 55 litres a hectare, um, for example. Um, B. Label tells you how to sort of handle the sort of chemical when to spray it when you can't spray it and things like that. So what I'm trying to say is we're sticking to the product label. The chemical companies have spent millions of pounds in data and research creating this label. Um, we're trying to keep everyone safe. We want to keep the environment safe. Um, so in the future, when hopefully pesticides are legal to spray with a drone, what you can and can't do will be listed on the label. I'm just trying to give you like a quick one-stop whistle tour of chemicals. Like I said, we can spend days on this. So please bear with me. Um, drift data. Um, that's one of the requirements that the regulator wants to see from us. They want to know, you know, scientifically, if you spray something, where, where on earth is it going to go? Is it going to go into the food chain? Is it going to go into adjacent crops? Is it going to go into water courses? Is it going to be poison the environment? All really sort of important and, and scary stuff, to be honest with you. So we've embarked on a series of experiments and we started with droplet analysis. So what we wanted to do was prove that the droplet sort of size that we were choosing was actually the droplet size that we're, applicant, that, that we're applying. And that's really important for drift data because the smaller your smaller your droplet size, the more sort of susceptible it is to drifting further off target or away from where you want to spray. Um, and then the next part is something called swath width, or your spray width, or how wide the drone sort of sprays. Um, from there, we can determine what our spray drift might be. So once we've determined our droplet size is correct. Once we've determined what our spray width is, let's say four meters, then we're able to determine um, our sort of end sort of drift data and um, where we're going to have drifted to. And here we're just doing a series of experiments with blue dye. And this is just so we can easily sort of record our droplets and where they go in just to determine our spray width. So what are some of the variables that determine sort of uh, spray drift? Um, like as I mentioned, we've got droplet size and flow rate. Our droplet size is independent to our flow rate. So we, we can maintain a droplet size, for example, but increase or decrease our flow rate depending on application rate. Um, flight speed, still working on that. You know, um, if you remain stationary, you drift, you, you drift is actually worse. If you go too fast, it's worse again. So there's a sweet spot in the middle there. Same flight height, fly too low. Are you going to be pushing? Is your downwash going to be pushing the chemical, you know, into the soil or not onto the uh, or, or, or onto the crop? You know, do you get sort of vortex and residual sort of washes from other areas? Um, the RPM of your rotors has an impact. So when we've got a full load, our RPM is higher. When we've got a you know, lesser load, our RPM is lower. Um, obviously, wind, temperature, and humidity there are the more obvious ones. But these are all the things that we need to prove to a regulatory standard in order to even begin the conversation about applying a pesticide in the UK. Uh, so moving on to sort of training and sort of barriers to the industry. Um, We've done it the hard way, we've done it all myself. We've created a, a course with Harp Adams University and Drone Spray Precision. Um, 
it's a sort of like a five day intensive course. Where you learn how to handle chemicals safely, operate and maintain your farm drone and safely execute spray and spreading operations in an agricultural setting. Um, it's a robust, structured, intensive approach to, you know, safety is the number one priority as always. The course covers CA approved, GBC qualification, Lantra approved, safe use of pesticides, sort of PA, PA1 certification, Lantra approved, applying chemicals with a drone certification as well, um, of like spraying and spreading. Um, So yeah, um, you could come on a course, for example, and you might be able to operate for us. That's one of the sort of um, roadmaps that we're trying to um, open up for people and we want to share the message and we want as many people sort of um, in this area with us. Um, we're not trying to sort of keep the space for ourselves. We want to help and educate other people. Um, So this is like my, my final thought really for the for the CPD session. Um, I just want to sort of get a point across that we're not, funnily enough, we're not precision farming, spraying or spreading. This is a, a new method of working, intelligence led. You know, we're going to be spraying. We might have 15, 20, 25 meter sort of spray drift. By far, not precise. There are horizontal boom spray nozzles that will get next to zero drift. Um, and we just wanted to sort of show the final video of the P100 in action the other day. And we've used one of those Insta360 cameras and it can be a bit you know, disorientating. So, um, oops, it's got a bit of sound, so I didn't expect that. Um, so an example that a farmer showed us was talking to us the other day he had a you know a multiple ton self-propelled sprayer and he had to drive a total of 28 kilometers in order to spray several areas of his crop which amounted to just two hectares or around two football pitches in size can you just imagine you know that the miles per gallon you're getting on that sort of that thing I dread to think plus the side effects of soil compaction diesel residue time equals money it's that, that took him all day you know, we, we, we'd be able to do that in about 20 minutes. Um, you know, there's other sort of factors, tractor deaths, farming machinery deaths are the highest in farming, it's the highest sort of for any sort of industry in the UK. Carbon footprint savings, you know, the list just goes on and on and on. Um, and we were able to perform this, like I said, about 20 minutes. And you can see the drone there. It's doing a bit of a, you know, you know, it's not doing a traditional forward and backward spray pattern. And what we've asked it to do is sort of effectively patch spray several different areas over that sort of um, crop of barley there. That, that, that's just water. And we're doing this as a part of a demonstration to sort of showcase that very sort of problem that I've just talked about. Um, so, yeah, I hope the 360 video is not sort of disorientated you too much. Um, And that's about it, really. Um, I suppose we just move into sort of the Q&A session now. Um, as I've said, I'm from my company's Auto Spray Systems. You can find us online. Get me added on LinkedIn. You'll see what we're up to. Message me. You can email me. And there's me direct phone number as well. Um, so, yeah, we'll just do the Q&A session out if there are any. And then afterwards, I'm, I live in Bolton. So I'm going to get a decent brew in peace. I'm going to have pasty peas and gravy. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Andy. I'm sorry I can't join you for those. Uh, but that no was a fascinating talk. Really interesting. Um, and out of interest, is that you on the side of that mount, of that cliff face? No, it's not. No, no. It's just a Windows um, Oh, okay, it's just a window thing. Uh, there we go. There we go. We can see yeah. that now. So that was that was really interesting. Thank you very much for essentially what is a sort of quite a quick and speedy oversight into some of the many use cases that you can uh, that there are available for using drones in within agriculture. I think it's fascinating. You touched on some of the 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 definite benefits there at the end. 
and the the work towards achieving net zero and the reduction of farm deaths side of things, I think, can't be underestimated, actually, given given what we're all working towards nowadays. So that was that was those are all in themselves other really good reasons for for pursuing this as well. But obviously, again, uh, given fertilizer costs and how much they have increased over over the last sort of 18 months, more than anything else, I think that's uh, extraordinary what you've you've put together. And thank you for sharing your knowledge here today. Um, so questions, please do pop them into the q and I can see a, a few that are coming through so far. Um, and I'm going to kick off with a question, which is, so what flight height and speed do you consider ideal? <laughs> uh, oh God, it just depends what we're spraying and spreading. Generally speaking, around two and a half, three metres above the crop and maybe around two and a half metres a second, between two and a half to five metres, five metres quite fast. Um, sort of depends on your application rate. Um, for seeding, for example, we, we flew higher at about six metres because there was no issues about drift. It wasn't really, didn't need to be that precise. You know, we wanted it to just to go everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we did a five hectare site, 20 million seeds. So the whole point was for it to. Mm -hmm. Are you that. out of interest on the on the reseeding side of things? Are you then going back afterwards to test what the to work out and calculate the the success rate essentially of those seeds? Yeah, well, forest research are going to sort of do that. Um, okay. But yeah, they're going to use like multispectral data and things like that and see. see, see Excellent. That's back. really good to know. Um, we, estimate, we estimate about 200,000 trees, so fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed, indeed. Um, so the next question is, hi, Andy, enjoyed that. Have you had feedback from organisations such as the Environment Agency or Natural Resources Wales slash SEPA on applications and spray drift issues? Not them. Uh, we've not spoken with them sort of directly or, or, or specifically, but it has come up with other sort of organisations. Um, we have been asked by the Welsh Government, you know, for example, to, to spray bracken. Um, we're still waiting for that chemical to be approved. Um, we're hoping we'll be able to spray that sort of this summer. Mm -hmm. See what happens, watch this space. Um, but yeah, like I said, we're working towards drift data for, we're building it to a regulatory standard with Silsil Spray Solutions. Um, they're the number one sort of spray drift, nozzle sort of, you know, scientific organisation in the UK and Europe, well renowned in Europe. And yeah, we're doing that to that sort of the highest standard. So we hope to answer those questions um, backed with scientific data as opposed to sort of estimates of what it says in half light app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sort of answers it a bit, yeah. <laughs> It's quite a new area, so I expect the the quest the answers aren't out there yet. Yeah. Um, so, uh, from the same same person, is there an established British standard for spraying that you work within, or is that basically down to the labelling you referenced? Um, as in sort of general spraying applications or drone. Um, I'm going to go with British standard for spraying as a generalism to start with, because obviously the, the drone side of things is so new that it, that yeah. I don't think there's anything there at the moment. There's certainly nothing that I'm aware of. Yeah, there, there is standards, you know, that's through the, the Lantra sort of you know, chemical handling sort of spraying qualifications. In terms of PA qualifications, there's, oh, I can't even remember how many there are, 20 plus, you know, and you'll have qualifications that cover spraying a pesticide um, from a boat, from a plane, from a knapsack, handheld, from a tractor. So there is there is a standard. Um, but like you say, we, we're coming into a new application method. Sort of is no standard yet. We're sort of working towards that. That's what we've built with our Lantra course, is a sort of standard of handling a chemical with a drone, with the tanks. You know, we've got to do things like triple washing. How do you triple wash a drone tank? Um, you know, how, how do you do that? They're the things that we've developed. And one of the things we've developed is to 
keep under your application rate and save enough water to reapply over the crop area, for example. So, you know, if you're spraying a pesticide in the future and you need to spray one type of chemical and then you spray another, how are you going to clean that on site? You know, you can't clean it there and wash it down the drain. You know, um, so we 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 like triple wash the, the tank, so fill it three times, reapply over the crop, and we've got a clean tank then for the next. It's just mm. one example. It's a small part of the cleaning process, but it's just an easiest one to. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting little areas to be, to consider as you're doing it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, last week or a couple of weeks ago, we were invited to the international spraying conference that was hosted by health and safety executive. Um, sort of hosted as well by the OECD sort of uh, crop research sort of group. And we spent two days on these topics trying to develop like a, a global sort of standard for drone spraying that, you know, all the regulators can adopt. Let's work in practice. We're contributing towards that. Um, so other sort of standards are coming. Yeah. Yeah. At the time. Yes, exactly. Okay, so, well, that's that's good and that's reassuring to know that there are standards coming. That's very reassuring. Um, the next question, thank you, Andy, for the talk. How do you find the XAG P100 in terms of capabilities versus other brands such as, such as the DJI Agris T40? Um, we found that the, 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 X, the XAG um, sort of devices all run CDA nozzles, so a spinning disc mm -hmm. allows us to um, alter our flow rate, our droplet size pretty much instantly. Um, we do it on our demonstrations, we'll have the drone on the floor, the drone in flight, and we'll say to someone, uh, what micron sort of droplet size do you want? Someone will say 80, we'll go right, okay, swipe on the app, change it to 80, and then we'll say, anyone else, give us a bigger one, we'll say uh, 300 microns, okay. And we just swipe on the app and it's done. And we found with the DJI stuff, there's a lot of clogging because it's the hydraulic sort of nozzle system, especially when we're putting um, coarser materials through it. Um, and the best thing is the, the independency from droplet size and flow rate. And the fact that we can alter the flow rate and maintain the droplet size is one of the big things. And we don't have that functionality with the, the DJI equipment. Mm -hmm. and if you wanted to change your nozzle or your droplet size on a nozzle system, some of the, you know, you may have six, four, six, eight nozzles on DJI system. Um, you've got to change the nozzles to reduce your droplet size or increase it. So you're handling, you're potentially increasing exposure, uh, operator exposure. Exactly. Okay, that, that's really interesting. Um, how do you make sure the nozzles don't clog for all spraying? As with irrigation systems, a one in N will clog with nutrient and introduce in inefficiency. Um, so we, we perform sort of like calibrations before and after sort of every operation. Um, we get readouts on the app, you know, on our, on our sort of instruments that tell us if there's an issue um, and that automatically halts additional spraying mm -hmm. when we investigate what's going on. It's a modular system, unlike the DJI, so we can unbolt a, an arm, a rotor, change it, can change the pumps, change the nozzles um, on site. Um, it's great. Yeah. So we've, we've not experienced any clogging, but it's now, even with the paint. Excellent, excellent. Um, next question, how do you exper uh, it's, I think this is meant to be, have you experimented with hydro mulching at all? No, <laughs> um, it is something that we've, we've sort of looked you at. May, sorry, two seconds. You may need to explain, not least to me, what hydro mulching is. So it's like uh, so you, you're spraying like a slurry of water, seed, fertilizer, mulch, dye, onto like depleted soils and sort of things like that. Ah, okay, thank you. We've not, it, it's something that we have looked at. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it sort of came up when we were looking at something called pluriculture as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll probably say to Harvey, message me after and we'll, we'll get into the, the, the details of that if you want. I think it's going to be a lot over a lot of people's heads. <laughs> Lovely, that's fine. And um, I have a question here saying, thanks, Andy. Uh, question about the A83 project. 
the yeah. area where you seeded, was it fenced off or was it too steep for deer to access and graze all the trees once germinated? It would be a great application if seeding is possible on steep cliff-like bits where deer can't access. Yeah, no, that, that, was, that was clear from deer um, mm. and sheep. Sheep are a pain as well. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, all, it was all clear. Um, it was a bit too steep for some of the deer, but um, yeah, we're probably looking at around a 50% gradient, something like that. Okay. Is it fenced off then too, so they can't access it? Yeah, that, that bit was fenced off, yeah. And it also mm -hmm. done a anti like a deer repellent um, application as well. Oh, okay. Okay. Excellent. Well, that's good to know that you can do. And um, do you do that at the same time or do you seed and then put the app, uh, the deterrent on afterwards? Um, that was done by, that, 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 that was all done in, in advance. Um, so a deer repellent is still a pesticide. Mm -hmm. um, something called like um, trico, something like that. It's, it's basically sheep fat, but mm -hmm. you 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 know you, it's a pesticide. It's a you, you're dropping a piece of chemistry against you know like a vertebrae, for example. So even if you, if you wanted to drop lager from your drone over over um, I don't know, sweet corn because it targets a pest or a disease, it's a pesticide. So even Something might not be a controlled substance like a hazardous chemical, for example, it's still a pesticide. Or something I've sort of forgot to mention really. But yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. That was the last question that I have there. If you have any more, please, you've got a couple of more minutes. Um, here we go, one straight in. Um, from Harvey, for the road job, what size of crew did you have? Three to four? Yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had. Um, so like two helping us, remote pilot and, you know, like an observer. Um, mm -hmm. So what we had is we had the remote pilot at the highest point with the RTK sort of station, um, like top of the crevice, if you will, to maintain line of sight from both sides, both visually and for RTK. And then we had an observer as well, assisting us next to the remote pilot. And we also had the ground team who were replenishing the batteries and the uh, the seed tanks. So yeah, about four. Okay. A lot more people there watching and filming and everything like that. But took three to four people. Yeah. Lovely. That's great. Any more questions? Final call for questions. Um, and then I will ensure that the recording is sent out to you later on this afternoon. It will also be up on the Arthur's UK website and also now new on YouTube too. So all our CPDs will be available there on both sites, sort of YouTube and our website. So please do uh, feel free to, to watch some of the other subjects that we've covered so far. If there are any particular subjects you would like to see covered, please do get in touch with me via membership at arpas.uk, A-R-P-A-S.uk. We're here to help the industry so please we can do that if we know what people want to be covered see covered uh information will be sent out later on andy's de contact details will also be on the email too so please do if you have further questions do get in touch with him directly uh, we have further cpds coming up in due course uh, including one coming up, if I can get my computer to play ball, I can tell you a few more details about it. Uh, we have a CPD later on at the, towards the end of June on detect and avoid without expensive sensors. Is this possible? Um, so that will be an interesting one with more coming through in due course. If you are yourself a uh, involved within the drone industry and would like to take part in this uh, CPD series, please do get in touch with me again. Um, we can discuss this further. We're delighted to see a, a number of you here today. As I say, there are lots. this will be available online to watch again later on. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. Your, uh, your experience is much appreciated and thank you very much for sharing that today with uh, the audience and then also on beyond no worries thanks for having us thank you very much i shall now cease recording <laughs>